Hi guys, my name is Jordan, and in this video, we're looking at another huge ant colony of mine, housed in one of our mega-sized acrylic nests. They are the notorious, highly invasive Linopithema humili, commonly known as Argentine ants. Originally, these guys were housed in a single test tube setup. Over time, I gradually added in more ants, which I collected from the wild. If you've seen my documentary on these guys, you'll know that Argentine ants are rather unusual in that they'll gladly merge together with foreign colonies of their same species. I collected the ants by simply lifting up rocks and logs within areas where I'd seen them around. Argentine ants usually create relatively shallow nests, so I'd flip a rock and the colony would be right by the surface. And then I'd just scoop them up, collecting as many workers, brood and queens as I could. Then I'd introduce them to my colony back home. Normally, I wouldn't condone collecting ants like this, as many ants are important for seed dispersal cycling and enriching soil, decomposition, and much more. And so, removing established colonies from the wild like this, especially the rarer species, can negatively impact the surrounding environment. Catching queens during nuptial flights is a far more sustainable practice. And I believe catching these young, newly fertilized queens makes for a far more rewarding experience. You see the colony slowly progressing from just a single queen tending to her first batch of eggs. Then, after all her hard work, you see the first generation of workers arrive. And years later, you'll have a thriving colony, thousands of ants strong. Plus, when collecting a mature colony, the queen is possibly already several years old, so she and therefore the colony likely won't last nearly as long as a young queen would. And of course, it's a huge shock to the ant system being taken from their homes where they've been happily living and thriving in for so long. To then be placed in an unfamiliar, captive environment, the stress from the move may be too much for them to handle and possibly result in their illness or death. However, I'm quite comfortable doing this with Argentine ants, as they are an invasive species here in Australia, and they're very good at displacing native animals, especially other ant species. So the less Argentine ant colonies out in the wild, the better opportunity native animal and plant species have to thrive. Just to clarify, this does in no way mean that I condone the practice of keeping exotic ant species, that is, species that don't exist in your area, like say, keeping bull ants over in Europe, or wood ants here in Australia, or newly established invasive species, like the incredibly infamous fire ants, who've just recently been introduced to parts of Australia. Argentine ants, on the other hand, are already well established where I live, here in Melbourne. And sadly, they're likely here to stay for good. So there's a big difference in that respect. Of course, you will need to take extra care that they don't escape. Otherwise, it could potentially be making the situation even worse. So I recommend only experienced ant keepers take on locally established invasive species, like these guys are for me. I decided to house my colony in extra secure acrylic nests. Quite small ones at first. But now, almost a year later, after progressively adding in more and more of these little guys, it quickly became apparent I was going to need to dramatically upgrade their setup. 
So our team got to work on designing something a little more suited to their needs. And this is what we came up with. We call it our mega sized acrylic nest. And rightly so. It's almost a metre long and half a metre wide. And as you can see, it's almost completely filled with ants. Remember when I told you guys my big headed ant colony, housed in one of my terrariums, had three egg laying queens and was exploding in population because of it? Well, I'd estimate this colony has at least a hundred queens. All those slightly larger ants you see, they're all queens. Pretty crazy, right? And for every queen present, I'd estimate there'd be around 200 workers. So if we do the mass, that puts the colony's population count at around 20,000. And with 100 potential egg laying queens around, it won't be long before even this mega nest is outgrown. I've noticed the queens like to spread themselves apart throughout the nest, with usually no more than 3 or so queens within each chamber. I suspect this could be a survival strategy. If the colony were to encounter some sort of danger, such as a harmful mold outbreak, or an attack from a predator, with them being separated, it increases their odds in having at least a few of their queens survive, and thus allow them to continue on the colony's lifespan. Not having all your eggs in one basket, as the saying goes. Quite a clever adaptation. I've also noticed that not all the queens receive an equal amount of care from the workers. Some attended to by hundreds. Others, only dozens. And every now and then, I even notice the workers culling queens. This one here had been aggressively bitten to death. It seems quite odd. Why would the colony want to kill one of their own queens? Wouldn't this just be dooming their colony? Well, it takes a lot of time and energy to tend to a queen. The workers are constantly grooming them, feeding them, keeping watch over them, at the ready to quickly defend and maneuver them away from potential threats. And they've always got to be around to collect any eggs they lay and carefully reposition them to a location optimal for their development. So perhaps these queens weren't performing as well as their collective colony would have liked and essentially were deemed no longer worthy for all that care. And so, the ants made the decision to axe them. Thus allowing more of their workers time and energy to be spent with a worthier queen. One who's more efficient and reliable in producing eggs. Plus, the culled queen's bodies don't go to waste either. They use them to nourish their developing young. Ensuring the well-being of the colony's future generations. You'll notice the ants love to hang their eggs up in little clusters on the ceiling of their nest. They seem to only do this with their eggs. The rest of their brood, the larvae and pupae, are normally placed on the floor. I'm not exactly sure why they do this. Ants, in general, tend to position their eggs within the most humid parts of their nest. So I think they may be placing theirs up there, as this is where all the condensation collects, and so suits their needs better than the floor would which is kind of cool in a way. It gives me an interesting reverse angle on the ants, which I wouldn't normally be able to see. You might have also noticed, throughout the nest, we've laser cut all of these holes along the top panel. These tiny holes provide the ants with a little bit of ventilation. I've noticed they seem to prefer inhabiting the chambers around them. It's where most of the queens and brood usually reside. Ventilation is definitely an important factor to consider when constructing a nest. It's quite clear that these ants are fond of the fresh air that these holes provide. What I've found most fascinates me about this colony is the way these ants navigate. Here we have the central hub of the nest, a crossroad of tunnels, leading to their favoured nesting grounds. And their foraging area. The constant flow of activity is almost mesmerizing. 
it makes you truly appreciate just how determined and productive ants can be. In terms of diet, I've been feeding these ants raw, unprocessed honey, which, like most ants, they can't seem to get enough of. I've also been testing out some of this specialised protein jelly. For most of my other colonies, I put in just a little scoop. But for these guys, I just placed the whole tub in for them. They absolutely love this stuff and go through most of it within just a few hours. In most cases, I prefer feeding my colonies whole raw foods, a variety of fruits, nuts, seeds, and insects. But aside from the occasional insect or two, this colony has been running solely on honey and jelly. Not all ants would be happy with this simple and repetitive diet, but I've found Argentine ants aren't at all fussed, and seem to be developing quite healthily. Just another one of the many adaptions which makes Argentine ants such successful invaders. It's great for me as their keeper too, as it minimises the amount of garbage accumulating around their nest. There aren't any seed shells or insect exoskeletons to worry about cleaning up. But of course, the ants still create garbage, in the form of their dead. Situated in their foraging area is a neat pile comprised of all the ants which have died from old age. Essentially, the ants cemetery. Every now and then, I'll come in with a bit of folded paper and scoop the pile out, just to keep things nice and clean. The ants also have designated bathroom areas, because, well, not all their food gets converted into energy. There's always excess. So whenever the ants need to go, they make their way over to one of these nominated chambers and relieve themselves communally. These chambers are usually positioned well away from the central ones, where all the brood and queens reside. And I've noticed when the ants are within close proximity of them, they'll frequently stop and take a moment to clean themselves, which they do by licking their forelegs and then scraping them over their bodies, like combs. For ants, sanitation is vitally important. I've also noticed, quite surprisingly, these super tiny bugs living amongst the waste. Even with my lens on the highest magnification setting, they're still just a speck on the screen. I'd say they'd be close to half a millimetre in length. But from what little I'm able to see, it's clear that the ants are interacting with these little guys. I see them regularly picking them up, carefully running them over their mouth parts, and then place them back down again, seemingly unharmed. So plainly, the ants aren't interested in killing and eating them. So what are they doing with them then? Perhaps it's a similar relationship which many ants have with sap-sucking invertebrates, like aphids and leafhoppers where ants are provided with excess sugars which these bugs excrete, known as honeydew. While the sap-sucking bugs receive protection from the ants, from would-be predators like ladybugs. So in this case, maybe the ants tend to these bugs in order to consume some form of honeydew. Or perhaps they recognise their beneficial value in the way that they consume and break down their waste, improving the sanitary standards throughout their nest. I'm not too sure. What do you guys think? And what do you think these tiny things are? I'm guessing some sort of mite, but I'm really interested to hear your thoughts.
Through regular experimenting, I've learned that Argentine ants prefer a relatively humid nesting environment. To hydrate their nest, I simply inject some water into these circular sponges here, which quickly soaks the water right up. This mega nest is designed almost identically to our regular size models, just on a much larger scale. Each are comprised of five separate layers of acrylic, stacked and screwed tightly together. Between each slide, there's a tiny amount of space, too small for ants to pass through, but large enough for water to. So once the sponge is soaked full of water, through capillary action, the water seeps through these tiny gaps and reaches the ants on the other side, providing them with both a drinking source and a slow and steady release of humidity. You'll notice this mega nest has six hydration points. I like to alternate between each one. So a few days after hydrating, say these two here, I'll hydrate the opposite two. Doing this limits the chance of mold and fungi developing, as the humidity conditions don't remain stable enough for them to survive. For the ants, it's no problem. They just simply move themselves over. An undertaking which Argentine ants are extremely quick and efficient at. I also have a test tube set up, placed within their foraging area. The water reservoir is blocked off with cotton, allowing the ants to drink the water as it slowly seeps through. So the ants have access to fresh water at all times, which is vitally important for the success of any ant colony. Their foraging area is quite a decent size, but because it's positioned directly within the middle of their nest, it's easily the quickest route from one side of the nest to the other. And the ants, in their constant quest of efficiency, quickly picked up on this fact. So now, it's almost always crowded with ants. It's like watching an ant highway. You may have noticed little bits of cotton within certain parts of the setup. The ants have actually been burrowing into the cotton within the test tube setup that I've got in the outworld. And they've slowly begun pulling out little strands. You can see they've laid a bunch by the entrance of their tube here. It looks as though they've created a little carpet for themselves. They've also been piling the cotton up by the entrances of their nesting area, the right side here in particular. I'm not exactly certain why they're doing this. The lid on their foraging area has thousands of tiny ventilation holes, offering the ants with a good amount of fresh air, but possibly a little too much at times. So they may be using the cotton to carefully limit the amount of airflow coming in and out in order to regulate the temperature and humidity conditions within their nest. Or perhaps it's for security reasons. They feel much safer having their nest entrances smaller and less exposed. Through studying this massive colony in this large scale nest, where all their activities are in plain sight, I've learned quite a lot about these little guys like how they prefer to scatter their brood in queens, rather than clustering them together, like many other ants do. And how they often cull the weaker queens. How they dispose of their garbage. Allocate certain chambers as bathroom areas. how they potentially recruit other bugs to improve the colony's sanitation. And so much more. This is what makes keeping and studying ants so fascinating. There's just so much new to learn and discover. It's one of those cases where the more you know, the more you know you don't know. So what do you guys think of this mega colony? Pretty awesome, right? So far I've taken it in to a couple of schools, and we're working on doing museum displays too. It's still just a prototype for now, but I don't know, 
Would you guys want to see something of this scale up on our store? I'm thinking there wouldn't be too many of you guys with colonies big enough to warrant one, but I could be wrong. I'd love to hear your feedback. It seems from many ant keepers that I've heard from, their ultimate goal is to have a massive colony like this one. But you've got to remember, the larger the colony, the more responsibility. They'll need to be fed and hydrated more often, and more time needs to be spent cleaning their foraging areas. Plus, ant colonies have a tendency for exponential growth. So once they're big to begin with, this often means they'll quickly outgrow their setups. Especially small, fast developing species with multiple queens like these guys. And if a colony of this massive scale were able to somehow escape your setup, then it could be a true disaster. Personally, I prefer caring for relatively small colonies and slowly watching them progress to maturity. Then, once they reach this sort of scale, it's time to say goodbye and release them back into the wild. Like I did in the past with my rainbow ant colony. But of course, because Argentine ants are an invasive species, this simply isn't an option for me. So this may be the last you guys see of this colony. After I've felt I've studied them enough, I'll likely be putting them down. I plan on placing them within a freezer overnight, the most humane way of going about the process. It's a hard thing to do, but needs to be done. The threat of them somehow escaping just isn't worth the risk anymore. On to a more lighter note, now it's time for our regular contest, where we'll be giving away two of our size two acrylic nets. Last video, I asked you guys what your favorite ant species was. Another tough question. For me, it's got to be bull ants. Their sheer size, excellent vision, and their rather quirky characteristics just makes them stand out from all the rest. And if I had to pick one particular species, it'd probably be Mamesia nigroscarpa. Such a huge and stunning looking ant. Whenever I come across these guys, they're always up to something interesting, whether it be on the prowl for prey. Building up their nests with debris to act as insulation. Or blocking rival ants' nests with their own garbage. And they're always very curious as to what I'm up to too. As soon as they catch sight of me, they immediately stop whatever it is they're doing and become fixated on my movements. Sometimes I have to sit still for a good few minutes before they lose interest. And finally, they continue on about their business. Plus, I've grown quite attached to the queen I've recently begun raising too. Featured in my bull ant video here. She's quite a quirky one. And check this out, her larvae have just begun spinning their cocoons. So probably in another month or two, her first workers will finally arrive. I'll be sure to update you guys once they do. Alright, now back to the contest. First up, it's our Instagram winner. Congratulations to... Abraham, who captured a shot of a weaver ant queen, Osophilia smaragdina. Easily one of my favourites too. These ants live up in the trees and form their nests by stretching and then stitching their leaves together, using their developing larvae silk as their thread. Here in Australia, we call them green tree ants after their beautiful, vibrant green coloration. Such incredibly unique looking ants. Now to the winner here on YouTube. Congratulations to Chasen Wild who answered Camponotus consubrinus, commonly known as the banded sugar ant, after the yellowish orange strip running across its abdomen. A very common species here in Australia, but fascinating to observe nonetheless, especially when they perform their tandem runs. Truly a sight to see. For the next video's contest, I want to know what's the most abundant ant species in your area? 
To enter, leave a comment below outlining the name of the ant, where you're from, and if you can, a little on what you've learned about them too. And same as last time, I want you guys to go outside and take some pictures of these ants too. Then post them up on Instagram and make sure to tag or include the hashtag Ants Australia so we can find it. We'll pick out a single picture over on Instagram and a single comment here on YouTube and the winners will each receive one of our size 2 acrylic nests with the choice of them in either green, red and now due to popular demand we're also making them in blue. We'll announce the winner in our next video where I'm going to be doing another long awaited DIY formicarium tutorial. So stay tuned for that. As always, thanks for watching this video and I hope you enjoyed.